this uh, semester. And thanks for uh, Luca Heed Martin for supporting uh, this uh, seminar series across multiple years right now. So uh, it is our pleasure to introduce our uh, speaker today, uh, Dorsa Sadiq. Uh, Dorsa is an assistant professor in the CS and the EE department at Stanford University. Uh, she graduated from UC Berkeley in 2017, uh, where uh, she was awarded uh, the um, uh, Leon Chua Award for contributions to nonlinear uh, sciences. Uh, since then, uh, she has been a faculty at uh, Stanford, where she got awarded the Amazon Faculty Award, and recently she got another NSF uh, Award. And uh, her work is uh, on um, uh, efficient algorithms for autonomous systems that safely and reliably interact with people. Uh, so uh, I'm glad to have Dorsa, and she wrote some nice words. It's raining in California. <laughs> Thank you. And, yes, thanks uh, again for Luca Heed Martin for the support for uh, this seminar. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks for inviting me. I'm super excited to be here. Um, it's raining in California. It's very sad. It's actually much warmer here right now. Very happy to be here. So yeah, so I'm Dorsa. I work in this area called human-robot interaction. And I'm very excited about this idea of designing algorithms for autonomous systems and robots that can actually interact with people and think about safety and then collaboration and all of these issues that could come up when we have a person working, working with an autonomous system with a robot. So when we think about interaction, maybe the first thing that might come to our mind is a picture that looks like this. Like when we think about people interacting with each other, we might have people working with each other on a, on a cooking task, let's say, and they're very good at manipulating the objects together. They're very good at working in a shared, shared space. They can collaborate, quickly predict what the other agent, agent in this case being one of these children, uh, can, can do next. And, and they're very good at handling this. And when it comes to more complicated settings, when you have more than two agents, so say you have multiple agents trying to, trying to play a sport, they're also, like people in general, are very good at handling that too. They figure out what the goal is. They coordinate with each other. They figure out who the leader should be, who the follower should be. And, and we have all these really rich collaborations and interactions between, between our humans. And when we think about our robots, that's kind of the thing we want, to, we want to get, right? We want to have robots in our own spaces interacting with us and doing tasks with us, maybe cook with us, collaborate with us, figure out what we want to do next. And that is actually like very, that's actually kind of the dream, right? You want to have these seamless interactions and not just in cooking and in, in many other applications. So as we see more and more robots coming into our everyday lives, like we, we see more and more of these applications where we think about human robot interaction in service settings, so maybe we are moving table together, or also in, in other types of settings like autonomous or semi-autonomous driving, or let's say controlling drones from the ground or, or even robotic surgery. So we see more and more automation coming into our everyday lives. And then all of these systems have to work with people, interact with people. And you should start thinking about humans and how they work with robots. Okay? So this is the dream. But when I started thinking about, and actually I was making this talk probably two days ago on the flight. Oh, yesterday actually, yesterday on the flight. And then I started thinking about well, where I see robots in my everyday life, other than the lab. Where, where are the robots in our everyday lives? Do, do we see robots? Are they, do they exist? And then I started realizing that actually there are robots in my, in my own city. So I live in San Francisco, and, and there is this coffee shop called Cafe X. My husband really likes this place. I don't know why. Uh, so every time we go to a movie theater in Matreon, like we go and get coffee from there. And everyone is super excited about this robot. There's a coffee machine somewhere else. The robot is not making the coffee. All the robot does is it grasps the coffee, and then the only interface that the person has is put in some number, and then your coffee arrives, and then you can pick up your coffee. So there is really like no real interactions that goes on between the person and then the robot. And the only social thing that this robot does is at the end it waves at you. It's like, oh, hey. So, so that, that is the only thing. But like people are super excited about this robot, and I just don't get it. Because think about it. This robot is behind the glass, and the human is in his own glass, if you think about it. And, and the only interface is this keypad, that number that I'm putting in. So this is not very interactive, right? There are robots in our everyday life. They're coming in, but, but it's almost like robots working in factories. It's not doing anything fancy. It's not doing anything that interesting. 
Then I started thinking more, and I realized, well, there are more robots in my everyday life. Another robot that I see in my everyday life is this particular security robot. There are a lot of these in San Francisco now. Every day I bike, like I run into some of these and some homeless people at the same time. But basically, we have these robots that are supposed to do security for us. So they're supposed to figure out if, if people are stealing or not. And they just like roam around. They don't really do anything. They have a bunch of cameras and scare people off. And then sometimes it turns out that sometimes they quit their jobs and they fall into, <laughs> fall into a pool. So this was a more interactive robot because at least it was sharing space with humans, but it wasn't doing anything that interesting. So then thinking about this problem, like a question that could rise is, why is it that we don't have interactive robots in our everyday lives? Why is it that we don't really have this interaction, more, more interesting interactions between humans and, and people? And, and, I, and I think about, when I think about that, I think there are like three main reasons. And the very first reason is we need to figure out what people are doing next. So modeling humans is really hard. And modeling humans properly for a specific task is actually quite difficult. So, and it could be that we don't have the correct model. Maybe we don't need to model everything, every single detail thing about the person, and that is fine. And maybe we can have like an abstraction of that model, but figuring out what is a good abstraction, what's a proper abstraction for a particular application can be quite challenging. So that is difficult. Let's say that I have my models of human. Let's say that I can predict what the person can do next. Even if I can do that, the next problem is the actual interaction. So thinking about adaptation, how humans and robots should adapt to each other, how they should collaborate with each other, work together, coordinate, or even coexist in the same, in the same setting is, is actually very challenging because now you're thinking about two agents working together and you need to have ways of thinking about that interaction. And the final thing is, even if I have humans right, and even if I have this interaction right, you should start thinking about what are some of these implications of these human-robot systems. If I bring in this interaction between my human and robot, can we think about how that is affecting society? Like, how is that affecting some of the global objectives that, that, that one might consider? So I think all of these problems are, are some of the reasons that make interactive, having interactive robots really difficult. And my research, I tried to address some of these problems. And, and today, specifically, I want to focus on some of the work that we are doing in each one of these areas. So I'm going to start talking about how one can learn models of humans, good models of humans. And then after that, I'm going to focus a little bit about this idea of interaction over control, which is this idea of I should model humans and the interaction that goes on between me and the human and use that for better planning for autonomous systems, so specifically the application of autonomous driving. And finally, I would just probably wrap up with this idea of societal implications of autonomous systems, which is kind of an interesting direction. And I encourage everyone to start thinking about these problems because if I put in my autonomous cars on roads, my autonomous cars on roads can actually have implications on, on global objectives like, like traffic, let's say, or congestion on roads or delay. And one should start thinking about these societal implications as we are putting more and more automation in our, in our life. So the plan is I'm going to mostly spend time on this first chunk, and then I'll briefly talk about these two, these two uh, other uh, ideas. So, okay. All right, so let's talk about this idea of learning humans' reward functions. So how can we go about learning models of humans? So one problem that comes up a lot in robotics and many other fields is, is this idea of how would we understand what it is that the person wants. We can model that as a reward function. We can model that as an objective. If you're from formal methods side of things, you can model that as specification. It's all the same thing. Like, what is the specification? What is it that we want the robot to do? And that's actually a very difficult problem. That's a reward design problem. So here's an example where I have this boat. And the boat uh, has an objective where it needs to just get high scores and hit things and get high scores. And under that objective, it learns to do this weird maneuver, which it circles around. And by circling around and hitting everything, it optimizes hitting the right points where it gets scores. And that is the optimal strategy that, that it comes up with based on that particular reward that says get high scores. So if I just optimize for get high scores, this is the behavior I get. And it's not necessarily the best behavior that we might want our boats to have or our robots to have. Okay. So, so that's difficult. So how, how should we go about learning better reward functions? If, if I'm going to model my humans as agents or optimizing a reward function, how should I come up with better reward functions? So the idea that we have been exploring is, well, if we can get demonstrations from people, 
or if I can get some information, some data from people, of, for example, how a robot should pick up an object, maybe I can go about learning a policy or a reward function that represents how this robot should pick up, pick up the object. Okay? That's, not a, that's a common idea. It's called imitation learning. Right? I'm going to collect trajectories, and then from those trajectories, I'm going to try to learn reward function or policy, and hopefully that will represent what it is that the person wants, as opposed to me saying, just pick up the object and optimize for that. So we decided to do this. We were like, OK, why not? Let's try this. So we have this robot. And in this case, the robot has three main tasks or three features. And the features are you got to reach your goal. So the goal is this, this black hat here. You want to avoid obstacles. So this box is kind of an obstacle. And then at the same time, it wants to keep its arm low. So it really wants to do it safely and keep the arm low. So those are the features that we have. And these are the features in the reward function. And what I want to do is I want to collect trajectories of how people do this and just learn how to do this task, right, in various environments. So not just in this one environment, in different environments. That's a problem of inverse reinforcement learning. Okay? So what we did was we have this setting where, where we have a user, in this case Andy, is providing data um, through a joystick. So he's just doing end effector people. And it's basically trying to teleoperate the robot to do this task. And pull so it turns out teleoperating robots is really hard. So it's kind of like the best thing that Andy can do in this case for simple end effector control. This is a person who has experience with the robot. So one big problem is teleoperating robots is really challenging. I have a robot with seven degrees freedom arm. It's kind of like a mess to, to get it to do the task. But let's say that I collect these trajectories. I collect my trajectories, and then I can go about learning my, my reward function. So the specific approach we're using here is called maximum entropy inverse reinforcement learning. So the only assumption that we have is probability of actions of humans is proportional to exponential of a reward function. So all that means is if I have an action that takes me to a better state, I'm going to weight that exponentially higher. So I have these trajectories from my robot that gives me probability of uh. And the thing I want to solve for is rh. Like this, is, this is a normal equation. I have this side of the equation. This comes from my data. All I want to do is I want to figure out what the reward function is, what rh is. And in this case, we are assuming rh is a linear combination of those features, those three features that I talked about. So those distances to the, to the, to the box, or distances to the table, or the goal. Okay. All right, so I collect my trajectories, and all I need to do is learn the reward function. What that means is all I need to do is learn the, the weights, the w's. And then if I learn that, I can find my policy, which is, which is the maximizer of that reward function. Okay. All right, so we did this, and then we learned the policy. So we learned what UHS star is. UHS star is a function of x, right? It's a function of states. Um, and I'm calling, yeah, I'm using UH for, for the actions for the policy in this case, and x for the state. And, and at the end of the day, I have a policy. And let me just replay that policy for this, for this case. So in this case, we changed the scenario just a little bit, so we moved the box from that side to this side. It's almost identical. And this is the policy that I've got from inverse reinforcement learning, from my collected trajectories. My robot is optimizing that. It should reach the black pad, and it's almost doing nothing. It's like dancing. So that was sad. Um, so why is it that it is doing that? So the problem is, my reward function is a linear combination of these features. And from the data that it has collected, it thinks that collision avoidance is really, really important. And it's basically doing a control that tries to keep it as far away as possible from this box. It really thinks that is the thing I should be doing, because that's so important. Reaching the goal is not that important. Collision avoidance is the most important thing I should be doing. So what we are doing is we are kind of like overfitting to this particular preference that corresponds to collision avoidance, which, which is not that great. And then kind of the lesson that we have learned from this is, is that diff it's very difficult to provide demonstrations on these robots that have high degrees of freedom. Sure, demonstrations have a lot of information in them, but it's actually very difficult to get good demonstrations. If you want to do any sort of human-robot interaction type of, type of work, we need to get data from humans, and then, then these demonstrations are challenging to get. We actually did some user studies where our users said things like, I had a hard time co controlling the robot, or I found the system difficult as someone who is not kinetically gifted. I don't know what that means, <laughs> being kinetically gifted. But people had a really hard time like, giving these demonstrations to our robots. So we thought maybe we should make this simpler. And our approach to making this simpler 
was to think about a different domain. We started thinking about driving. So if you think about autonomous driving, well, people can drive, right? I know how to drive. All of you know how to drive. And, and that provides good demonstration, right? I think my driving is really good, so I can provide really good demonstrations when it comes to driving. And if we can get demonstrations of how people drive, maybe I can try to go and learn this reward function. But this was also problematic. So there's a study uh, at Berkeley where the, the authors bring in users to, to drive on a car simulator, and they basically collect those trajectories. And they tell the users to come back next week. The users come in, and they replay the exact same trajectories to, for, for the same people. And it turns out that people do not like their own driving. People think their own driving is too aggressive. So, so then if that is the case, then driving demonstrations are not even informative for us to learn a reward function for, let's say, how an autonomous car should drive. So demonstrations are giving us all these troubles, right? They're, it's, they're hard to get, they're not informative, and, and they're not that useful, and you might overfit to them. So our idea was maybe instead of thinking about demonstrations, we should be thinking about comparisons. So we started thinking about comparisons, pairwise comparisons, because they're also very useful in terms of learning this desired robot reward function. So what do I mean by that? So what I do is I, I bring in my users, and I show two different trajectories on my robot. In one trajectory, let's say the robot picks up this object. In another one, it picks up the blue cup. And I ask my user, well, which one do you prefer? And based on the human's response, I'm getting some information about this underlying reward function or preferences that the person really wants. So it's just a simple question, a query, that I would be asking my user. Okay. I can do that for more complicated settings where I have different trajectories. I have trajectory psi A and psi B, and then I would ask my user, which one do you prefer? Do you like psi A or psi B? And, and what I'm really asking is, do you like the reward function evaluated on this trajectory or the reward function evaluated on the other trajectory? Again, assuming that this reward function is a linear combination of a set of features, same features as before. And the human's response is telling me which one of these two is higher, w dot phi a or w dot phi b, where phi a are the feature vectors evaluated on trajectory a, and phi b are the feature vectors evaluated on trajectory b. Let me just move things around to make it simpler. So I'm going to define this new phi. The question I'm asking is if w dot phi is positive or negative. So that single question, that single query I'm asking is just, respond, is just telling me which one of these two is higher for that particular example. So let me make this a little bit more concrete. So imagine w lies in a three-dimensional space. Okay. For my case of the robot case, I had three features. So w lies in a three-dimensional space. I can assume W comes from a unit ball because I only care about the sign of W. I can also sample this unit ball using my favorite sampling method. And then every question, every query I'm asking my user generates a separating hyperplane in this space. And the human's response to that one single question is basically telling me which side of this hyperplane is preferred. So based on that response, what we are going to do is we're going to update these samples. And, and we assume our humans are noisy. The humans are not going to be perfect. So since humans are going to be noisy, we are not going to completely remove the wrong side of the hyperplane. Instead, what we do is we reweigh these samples based on a noise model. So specifically, we're using a Boltzmann distribution, assuming humans are following this Boltzmann rationality model, choice model. And then under that assumption, we can reweigh our samples using an update function. So I'll end up in the situation right this. So, so far, all I've done is I've asked one question. And from that one question, I've reweighed my samples. And remember, like one of these points correspond to the true reward function that the human really wants. That's a preference of the human. And I want to just converge to that. So what can I do? Like The idea is I'm going to come up with the next question that I can be asking from the human. And what I want to do is I want to come up with the most informative question that I could be asking to quickly converge to the reward function. So I can come up with a question that corresponds to this hyperplane, and that might just hone in on the right information. Or I might ask a question that, that gives me this hyperplane, and that doesn't really like, give me that much information. So what question we are asking in this case really matters. And the way we think about this is when we are generating these queries, we should generate them actively, and we should synthesize them directly from the continuous space. So what I exactly do is this optimization. So all I'm doing. I have this update function for how I'm updating based on the human's response. 
And then what I'm doing is I'm trying to find these queries, these questions, these scenarios that maximize the minimum volume that's being removed based on that question. So whatever the answer of that question is, I'm trying to remove as much volume from that space as possible because I'm trying to converge to the, to the quick, uh, quickly converge to the true preference reward function. So, so this is kind of a volume removal objective that we are doing in this case to come up with the most informative queries one can be asking in this setting. And then there is a constraint here, and that constraint is actually important. The constraint is these queries should correspond to realistic trajectories that I can actually simulate on my driving simulator. So, so they have to be realistic. They can't be nonsense. Okay. So, so this is the part, like optimization that, that runs at every time step. And then at every time step, I'm coming up with the most informative question. I get an answer, and I keep doing that. And I can try to convert to a reward function. So we tried this on a simple example. And what we saw was this active synthesis method is actually converging much faster than non-active methods. And in addition to that, we tried it for, for a driving case. So we created this game almost where, where we generate these two trajectories and then we ask our online users, like, which one do you prefer? And we keep doing this to try to converge to the reward function. So this is actually difficult to e evaluate because you don't have the true reward function of people, right? These are like people who are putting in like values in here. How do we know what's a true reward function or if we have reached the true thing? So in this case, what we did was we tried to just plot like what our users converge to. And it's interesting. So this is the before picture. This is the after distribution. And we have five features for this driving case. And what we see is that all of our people, all of our users converge to similar and reasonable weights. So each line corresponds to a particular user and their weight, the converged weight for that particular feature. Another interesting thing was like some features matter more here. Like for example, heading. Heading of the vehicle is way more important than collision avoidance. Something I wouldn't think about normally. But I guess like thinking back, it is true that heading of your car is kind of important. Um, so, so this was kind of interesting because it kind of tells us that the thing that we have learned here is a reasonable reward function that models what people are really, like what people's preferences are. Another thing that we decided to do in this data was um, we tried to compare this reward function with perturbations of, of the, because we don't have the true reward function, we tried to compare it uh, to other reward functions using perturbations of the W that is learned. And then we, uh, we actually ask our users to rank policies that are emerged from these different, different Ws, and our users strongly preferred the learned policy from our model compared to all these other perturbations. So, which tells us that the thing that we have learned actually corresponds to driving, which is kind of nice. All right. So let me go back to this optimization. This was the thing I was running, right? I was trying to optimize the minimum volume that's being removed and come up with the most informative query to learn humans' preferences. Yeah. So in what sense is this interpreted as a volume minimization problem? Could you clarify? Yeah, so um, the idea was, so imagine W lies even in a two-dimensional space. So if W lies in a two-dimensional space, I have W1, W2, there is like a true W1, W2 I'm trying to reach to, right? And then like if I'm, when I'm sampling, when I have these samples, every question I'm asking is a hyperplane. So what we want to do is, so let's say that the human tells me this side is good. So I'm going to remove everything on the other side. And then the next time step when the human, like when I want to ask a question, I should ask a question that removes as much volume from this side. And every question corresponds to a hyperplane. So let's say this is my second question. This is question one. This is question two. And based on, again, the human's response, I might get this side, right? So I might remove this. So um, the space we are looking at is the space of the weights or the space of reward functions. And then that space, we want to remove as much as possible to converge to a particular, like, W. And that, the way we model it, we could model this using entropy, too. But the way we model it is using volume removal, because that's a submodular optimization and gives us some convergence guarantees. Since the space of weights, as you display it here, is uh, in a, of infinite extent, mm -hmm. uh, presumably you are I'm not bounding yet, but like you did with the sphere representation or, mm -hmm. or ball representation, right? So that yeah, 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 you can yeah. Think so it's about volume, right? yeah, so yeah. The related question then is really, if you go to the ball representation, then once the number of weights goes up, a high mm -hmm. number of weights, a high dimensional ball, then most of the volume in the ball lives on a thin shell around yeah. the outer boundary, right? Yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah. So 
how do you do it? How, how do you do it? That's a very good question. So, um, yeah, so it is a yeah. So when we think about it as as a sphere, you're right because uh, we are assuming that weights are normalized. So that's why we can live in the unit ball. Um, and right now, for these driving examples, or for all of the examples we have, it's like five six features. It's not like a super high dimensional case. For that, we are trying to use other, so we're not using volume removal for that. So we are using determinantal point processes as a way of like measuring diversity for these higher dimensional spaces. So we are thinking about other notions of diversity in those settings. And we don't have like necessarily the same guarantees of convergence that one might have in the volume removal case. But yeah, it doesn't scale up. Like, like if I have a neural network representation of my reward function, like that, I don't have any hope using, using this approach. There are many examples where you cannot map references to weights. Mm -hmm. There's no theory that tells that we have a continuum of weights. Even in the passing example that you mentioned that we have studied, the preferences are purely logical and you cannot have a continuum. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. That you can actually map everything to a weight space that's continuum. Yeah, so we are defining things over our features, right? So, like, I might, one of my features could be a logical feature, or I might have a. Like, Depending on how expressive I choose my features, this could be successful or not successful. So it does depend on my feature feature vectors as well. Um, the so so what was the second so so what was the second part of the question? The, the basic question is we have oh yeah a ton of evidence from psychology, behavior, and others. Yeah. Cannot map yeah. To continuous vector space or anything like that, they are purely logical preferences, and even that you have partial knowledge. Yeah, so, and then there is this issue of stated preferences versus non-stated preferences. I don't want to go to many of these things, but this we know for sure. So, but that depends. Weights, that's mm -hmm. a very simplistic view of things. Mm -hmm. Passing example specifically, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. we have studied, mm -hmm. that's not true. So, I think when we say preferences, it, like, captures a lot of things, right? Like, the, like for example, in psychology, when we talk about preferences, it could be on, completely, like, on a psychology study. But in this case, when we're thinking about driving, like, if, if I'm sitting in a vehicle, like, there are a set of features I, want, I don't want the car to collide. Like, that's like, like, if I have an example that the car is colliding, an example that the car is not colliding, like that's kind of like a clear preference. So I think a lot of examples that we are doing in robotics are very functional. And for that particular reason, like, learning this type of reward function is not a terrible approximation of what it is that people want. But I totally agree it's an approximation. It's not like the true thing that the person like, wants. There could be, like in many different scenarios, like people's preferences might change. Like if I'm looking at near accident scenarios, this reward function might be nonsense. But, but for specific functional scenarios, like this is actually learning reasonable behaviors that if you, if you replay it to people, people are very happy with that. Does that answer your question? It doesn't answer your question. <laughs> you can talk about it offline. No, no, because the, the question is different. Right? The question is to what extent you can actually replace logical models with these vector space models. Oh, so you're talking about what if, what if like one of these features? So, so what one thing I can do is. My features could be logical representations too. Like, like my features right now are these super nonlinear elements, right? I can have a feature that corresponds to a logical, well, what could, could correspond to an LTL specification. And I can try to think about like how much people care about that LTL specification by learning a weight for that. But each one of the features could be discrete or could be continuous, right? It doesn't have to be this particular continuous case. In my examples, I'm using this continuous case because I'm using these distances. But it doesn't have to be like completely continuous. My feature could be correspond to if the light is green or not green, right? Green or not green is going to be a binary thing. And I can try to learn like weights for that corresponding to like what state I'm in. Okay. Any more questions? All right. So let me go back to this, this setting that I have. Okay. So I have this optimization. This is the optimization that I'm running. Um, I am optimizing the volume that's being removed subject to a set of queries. And we started doing user studies with this. There was a big problem. And the problem was this was really slow. So synthesizing queries takes too much time. And, and the reason for that is you actually need to wait for humans' response and get humans' response, and then based on that, generate the next query. So these queries need to come in sequentially. I'm doing active learning. I actually need to wait for the, to get the response of the person and then generate the next query. Okay? So what my algorithm is trying to do is something like this chess master is doing here, it's trying to like optimize and come up with the best thing it can do and figure out the most informative, most optimal thing. And while it is doing that, the human who is interacting with this person is going to fall asleep. So if you're under this setting, our idea is like, what should we do to, to the, the thinking is what should we do to make this faster? 
And our idea is maybe instead of synthesizing a single query at every time instead, which is the most informative, useful thing you can do, maybe we should synthesize a batch of queries instead. So that's going to help us with timing, right? I'm going to create a batch of things and then ask the user for, about, about that batch and then go about that. Okay? So how do, we, how do we formulate this batch active learning problem? So we can go back to our formulation where we are optimizing the minimum volume removed. Okay? And then instead of synthesizing one query, I'm going to synthesize B queries. B is my batch size. And I have two to the B possible options for, for, for my batch, like what goes in my batch. Again, subject to the fact that each one of these queries are going to be reasonable queries that correspond to realistic human driving. Okay? So an interesting question to ask is, well, in each one of these batches that I'm picking, like, what are the samples that should go in there? Like, what, are, what are these samples? What are these scenarios that I'm picking? So going back to this picture, um, the, the, yellow, uh, the yellow hyperplane corresponds to my second query. And I might want to ask my third query, which goes in the same batch. And if I want to pick another informative query, I might come up with this blue hyperplane. And the blue hyperplane is also very informative. But if you think about it, with respect to the, the yellow hyperplane, it's not that informative, right? Like if I'm picking both of them at the same time, like both of them together are not going to give me that much information. So what we are trying to do here in this batch active learning problem is very similar to the problem of joint entropy maximization. So we have a bunch of different samples. You're picking a batch of them. There's a joint entropy between them. And we actually need to make sure that they're as diverse as possible inside of each one of these batches. And joint entropy maximization is known to be intractable. So, so we, we have some approximations for them. Some of the approximations are also known to be intractable. So what we decided to do is we decided to come up with a few heuristics that try to actually solve or address this problem in, in practice. So the most naive thing one could do is, is to use the greedy algorithm. So, so the greedy idea is, let's say I have 12 samples. These 12 samples correspond to each one of these hyperplanes. So in this case, the points correspond to the hyperplanes. And I want to pick five of them. So I want to pick a batch of five that corresponds to five queries that I would be asking my user. And if I'm doing greedy, what I'm going to do is I'm going to select them independent from each other. I'm not going to think about the dependency between my samples. And this is what I'm going to get. I'm going to get these five samples that are chosen independent from each other. And each of them alone is going to be very informative. Okay. So that's not that great, right? Like we already see that these, don't, these samples are not going to be very diverse in my batch. So instead, we've tried out a couple of algorithms. I'm not going to talk about all of them. But the specific algorithm that worked out very well is this idea of successive elimination. Uh, so the idea of successive elimination is actually coming from this problem of maximum diversification. And then what we do in this case is we, our algorithm, what it does is it chooses the closest two pairs. And then it's going to remove the one with the lowest entropy. So as I said, it's just a heuristic. But it turns out that this particular heuristic works very well in terms of coming up with the most diverse samples that one could have in this setting. So in this setting, we are going to be the left with these five different samples that are actually quite diverse in, in, this, particular, in this particular case. So the closest two samples in terms of mutual information, for example? Yeah, in terms of mutual information. So that is going to be? Not a submodular problem, but a epsilon mm -hmm. region submodular problem. Then yeah. This algorithm should work in an epsilon optimal way. Yeah, so actually we do have theoretical guarantees that says it, in a similar way to, to submodular optimization, this algorithm also converges. Okay, so have you, have you, have you considered mutual information not pairwise, but... More the, larger? Yeah, we have considered that scalability is one of the big issues there. But yeah, we have considered like this like, multi-wise type of mutual information. So, any results that show that? Because we have many examples of the metrics, depends on what entropy and other things you use, that this really does not work. Meaning that you, you do the one, and then if you want to do the second, even the first, mm -hmm. right, you actually do worse. Mm -hmm. Here, there are many problems in terms of properties and so forth. So, do you have proofs that after every iteration you improve? Um, no. We so, so with greedy, we don't have any proofs. But with, with successive elimination, it does like translate to similar to similar problems to submodular optimization. So we do see like improvements. So we do we do see diminishing return. So for act actually successive elimination, we'll have theoretical results that it does converge under a set of assumptions which are actually very strong assumptions. So ignoring errors from discretization, sampling, and human noise, it is going to converge. But these are actually things that 
in reality, cause a lot of problems. So in reality, I'm going to have discretization errors. I'm going to have sampling errors, like human noise model errors. So, so, but, but if we ignore any of these other errors that come from all these other places, we can have convergence guarantees. And in this case, you're going to converge to a local optima, right? Uh, in this case, we are going to converge to a local optima. Yes, yeah. Bounds on the local optima or any, any mm. performance or divided? One sec. Are we going to converge in local optima, actually? Um, I don't. We don't have any bounds, so like I'm sure of that, but I'm just thinking if this is um, going to be global or local optima, depending on the problem. Yeah. Yeah, we don't have any bounds on that, actually. Yeah. So yeah, so the theoretical results that we have here is not necessarily strong theoretical results. I'm not like I'm not actually advertising the theoretical results of this. I'm basically saying this problem translates to some existing problem in submodular optimization. Has, does enjoy some of the some some of the theoretical result, theoretical guarantees that exist in submodular optimization. The interesting thing here is actually you can have this balance between batch size and and the informativeness of the query and actually use this in robotic settings. So so that is kind of the the main uh, point of the, the, this particular work. So here is actually some convergence um, convergence plus so empirical results when we think about the synthetic reward function. And uh, the non-batch active method converges much faster than, than the other methods. That's expected because we're not using batch active learning. But if we're using batch active learning using successive elimination, we're going to get the yellow curve, which, ha which is actually not that bad compared to, compared to the non-batch method. Okay. So we've tried this for a couple of different examples. Here is one example, which was a driving example. So what we do is we come up with these queries, like similar to before. And then in terms of convergence, this is actually the result that we get in terms of convergence. Again, in, in green, we have the non-batch method. So this is a normal active learning. And then the orange curve actually gets close to this, uh, this non-batch method towards the end, and it does converge to a similar type of result. But the cool thing is in terms of timing, the successive elimination performs much better than, than all these other methods. So ex specifically, in terms of timing, successive elimination takes around five seconds versus a non-batch method, which takes around like 79 seconds. So if I have my Amazon mechanical turkeys are sitting there, I can take five seconds to generate the next, the next set of queries. But taking 79 seconds is actually quite long for, for learning these reward functions. We tried it, uh, this out for a couple of different simulation environments. Another environment was this tosser example. So I have an agent that tries to throw a ball, and it knows nothing about throwing balls. And the preference is to get the ball in the green basket as opposed to the red basket. And something interesting that we saw here is that successive elimination actually converges uh, faster than the, than the non-batch method. And the reason for that is the non-batch method, in this case, is solving a continuous optimization problem. It's solving a nonlinear, non-convex problem that could totally fall into local optima and then end up in that situation. But successive elimination is discretizing the set of spaces and choosing, choosing um, samples from that discrete space and doesn't have the same, the same problem that you, one would see in, in continuous optimization. Okay. And again, in terms of timing, it's doing much better. So let's look at, actually, let's look at the driving example. So in this particular driving example, uh, after zero queries, the car has no idea how to drive. After 30 queries, it learns how to keep heading. And then finally, after around 70 queries, it learns how to, how to drive. It learns how to avoid collisions and then keep, keep heading and, and all of those tasks. And the interesting thing here is there was like no demonstrations. Like this was just based on preferences. This was based on 70 simple questions I'm asking someone to, to learn how to drive in this case. We also tried this out for, for, for a tosser example. So in this case, after 10 queries, it kind of learns how to throw a ball. After 40 queries, it lear learns how to throw the ball towards one of the baskets. And then finally, around 100 queries, it learns how to throw the ball in the, in the right basket, which is, which is a green basket that, that we were looking for. Right. So another simple idea that, that we, we tried, uh, in addition to this preference-based learning, is maybe we should warm start our, our, our preference-based learning algorithm using demonstrations. Maybe I can try out and try give a couple of demonstrations, and those demonstrations would warm start my algorithm and make things much better. And that's actually a very intuitive thing, right? Demonstrations are very informative. They have a lot of information in them. They're really hard to be accurate. They're not very accurate. On the other hand, preferences, they're more accurate. If you tell me I want to collide or I don't want to collide, that, I can get a lot of information from that. But it's actually just like one bit, one bit right? Like I'm not, it's not rich, but it's very accurate. 
So our idea is maybe we should combine both demonstrations and preferences together to try to learn these reward functions. And in this particular case, like we have the case where we don't have any demonstrations and we see convergence uh, for the driver example. And then with, um, with starting with one demonstration or three demonstrations, we have a better, better convergence. And obviously, it starts from a much higher up uh, place because we are warm starting and we already get a lot of information from that single demonstration that a person can give us. We've tried this for the reaching example on the robot. The interesting thing on the reaching example is Three demonstrations is not that useful, but one demonstration is better. And, and we, we hypothesize that the reason for this is getting demonstrations on the robot is really hard. So the demonstrations we are providing are not good demonstrations. So it's not learning much from those demonstrations. So one is enough for us to warm start from somewhere, but adding more demonstrations is actually hurting us in this case rather than helping us. So that was kind of an interesting thing to see and think about like this balance of how many demonstrations and how many preferences one should have to learn this reward function. So let me show this actually on the, on the actual robot. So remember this was the IRL policy. This was the thing that was just learned on, on uh, demonstrations. On the other hand, we have, we have the uh, policy that comes from our algorithm using both demonstrations and preferences. It's not perfect. Let me try the IRL too. It's not perfect at all. Um, but it does something much better than IRL, which is promising. So uh, it still stays quite high up, and it doesn't really reach the goal. We actually moved the table a little bit down, too, so the actual true goal is around here. But it doesn't really reach the true goal. Um, but it does much better than this dancing behavior that the IRL policy does. Uh, in addition, we tried this on, on, a, on 15 different users, and uh, through our user study, the results we got was, well, people strongly preferred our, our method, and they thought they accomplished the task better, it did what they wanted, it was easier to use, they would use it again, and then in addition to that, they thought that it was better at the task, and they preferred this particular system over this inverse reinforcement learning. All of these results were statistically more significant than the other method, except for this ease of use. So as you remember, people were not very happy with providing these demonstrations. So that was actually not a significant difference between the two, between the two algorithms. So providing these demonstrations was actually quite difficult for our users. Okay. All right, so just to wrap up this section, so the key idea here was we need to use comparisons and demonstrations together combined with each other to try to learn these human's reward functions. You can call it preferences, but it's really a proxy, a proxy a reward function for what the human wants the robot to do. And the specific approaches that we have been, I've been describing is we've been doing an active synthesis approach where we actively synthesize new compares and queries to try to learn these reward functions. And we also use a batch active learning method where it helps us to, to, uh, to, to reduce query generation time. And it also helps us to parallelize. For example, if I want to learn a reward function of a population as opposed to a reward function for one person, I can use something like this approach and parallelize it and it would be much faster. This is also work that my grad students, Erdem, Andy, and Nick, and Glub have been working on. Glub have been doing all the robot side of things, so we're so grateful for having him. So let me just talk about a few directions that you're exploring further like in, in this area of learning good models of humans. So, so as I said, giving good demonstrations is really difficult, but, but teleoperating robots and giving demonstrations is actually a very important problem in robotics, right? If I, if I want to have an assistive robot, I want to be able to teleoperate these robots. And if I have all these issues like of controlling the robots, that's not very useful. So one problem we are exploring right now is if I have a high degree freedom robot, and if I can, can condition that maybe on, on state space, I can condition this arm to, let's say, just, just move around to sweep this particular line, I can try to come up with a much lower dimensional control space to control the to control this particular uh, arm, right? I can just do positive and it would go right and negative and it would go left. So there exists a lower dimensional control space that I could be using here to, to, to control my robot arm instead of giving the exact joint angles of each one of these five degrees of freedom. So our idea is can we try to learn that directly just, just from teleoperating robots? And, and can we try to uh, learn specific preferences of people? Maybe someone means right when they press plus, but someone means left when they plus, uh, press positive. And the idea is how do we go about learning these particular uh, teleoperation maps? And, and we are currently working on some, some of these ideas, but just wanted to briefly mention that. 
Another direction on the more theoretical side of things is this idea of learning reward functions is very interesting, right? But I've been talking about these reward functions that are just a single function, a reward function that's W times P, and that's it, right? But what if my reward function is a little bit more complicated? What if I have a mixture model that represents my reward function? How can I go about learning mixture models using these preferences? And when you think about mixture models, it turns out that comparisons, pairwise comparisons, are not even enough for us to try to learn the reward function. So instead, we actually need to get to full rankings and get humans full rankings on different scenarios, and then based on that, to learn the mixture models. So what we're trying to do is think about some of these uh, mixture model learnings in the active setting and try to be more efficient in, in these particular settings. All right, so I'm not doing great on time. So I think I'm going to just jump into some of the future directions that we are thinking about. That might be actually a better use of time. So, um, so in the second, second section, which I'm skipping right now, the idea is if I have these models of humans, if I have these reward functions that I model the human, let me actually show maybe that one slide. So let's say that I have now a human. My human is this white car, and my human is a human-driven car. And I have an autonomous system, that's the autonomous car, the orange car. And what we want to do is we want to think about the interaction that goes on between these two vehicles. And we can assume that we have direct control over the actions of the autonomous car. This could be steering angle and acceleration. But if you think about it, we also have indirect control over the actions of the human. For example, if I cut in front of the human, that influences people, right? That influences people to slow down and make room for you. So we have indirect control over the actions of the human. Let's call that UH. This is, again, steering angle and acceleration. Okay? And the way we model this interaction that goes on between these two agents is as a dynamical system, specifically an underactuated dynamical system, because we have indirect control over the actions of the human. And, and what we do is um, we try to find these actions for the autonomous car. Let's call that UR star. It's a maximizer of a reward function for the autonomous car. In this whole like, previous section, we've been talking about how to learn these reward functions. Let's say I've learned the reward function that the robot should follow. I can put that in there. And the interesting thing is this reward function is usually a function of state and actions, which is what we have been talking about. But in this interactive setting, we're saying this should be a function of the actions of the human because I'm influencing humans. And well, in this case, my human is actually operating. So the question is, what does the human do? And the way we model these humans is as agents who are approximately optimizing their own reward function. And that's our age in this case. Okay? So the only thing, the only main getaway, uh, getaway from this section is to think about this, this two-player game that exists between these two vehicles. Right? My actions influence the human. The human actions can influence me. And I have this nested optimization here that I actually need to solve. And there are a lot of interesting questions just in this one slide. Like, one interesting question is, what is our age? Like, how do I know what the reward function of the human is? Can I do imitation learning? Can I do preference-based learning to figure out what our age is? Um, can I trust that our age? Is that true in all settings? Like, what if I'm in a near accident scenario? Do humans, do humans optimize a reward function when it comes to a near accident scenario? So all of those are great questions to ask. And even if I have our age, and even if I know UHS star, like what the human does is the optimizer of our age, that, that, is not, like, that, that doesn't make this problem much easier. Because now I have to solve this nested optimization with nonlinear, non-convex objectives on the vehicle in real time. And that is quite challenging, right? Like this could totally fall into local optima. Like what, to, what should we do? Should we make this a linear system? Maybe not. So, so this is actually quite difficult. And we try to address some of these difficulties as part of this interaction over a control problem. Um, skipping all of the details here, because I want to just get to the final part of the talk. But let me just show you what are the implications of this. So, so one implication of this is if I have my autonomous car and I have a human-driven car, Normally, what autonomous cars do is they do something like this. They, slow, they look at the velocity of the human, they project that, and then they slow down and wait for the human to pass and merge behind them. We actually like, see this like, with autonomous uh, cars on the road. This is actually an example of a Waymo car that is trying to change lanes. It signals, it's doing everything right, and it's actually in the exit lane, so it wants to change lanes and go back to the normal lane. But none of the cars are letting this car in, and it's, it's not doing anything because it's not trying to be interactive. It's trying to just be safe. And it has to exit and come around and do this again. So, so that's not ideal. 
Um, so what our algorithm does based on solving this nested optimization is instead of doing this type of approach, our car decides to cut in front of the person. <laughs> <laughs> and you might say this is a very aggressive maneuver, but I would argue this is more human-like. And this is actually safer. If there's a car behind you, a car behind you expects you to do this. Um, yeah, and, and then this is, this is actually very interesting because none of this came out of like hand coding. This all came out of the optimization. And out of the optimization, the car decided that I should cut in front of this person because I have a model of this person. And this person is going to respond to me and is going to actually slow down. And everything is going to be great. Okay. <laughs> so a big question is, how am I so sure that this guy is going to slow down? And we ran into this video where, I, again, I have a truck driver. I have a vehicle on the side of the road. It's doing a, it's trying to do a lane change, doing everything right. And then for some reason, this truck driver is not letting this car in. <laughs> the simple solution in France is to put your filter up, to turn left or right. They have to give you the right of the way or they get a big ticket. <laughs> yeah, that's a good way. So that's enforcing it, right? That's actually enforcing some of these things, some of these rules. But humans here like, don't necessarily behave by the book. And humans have different driving styles, right? Like when it comes to driving, like you might have aggressive drivers or timid drivers or attentive drivers or distracted drivers. And you can't just rely on a single driver model where we assume everyone follows the exact same reward function. You need to actually be able to differentiate between these driving styles and model that in an online fashion. So what we do is, in addition to think about, thinking about this interaction that goes on between the vehicles, we think about information gathering too. So what we do is, um, let me, again, skipping a bunch of slides. What we do is uh, we think about it as an objective that kind of looks like this. We have theta here. Theta corresponds to the driving style of the other driver. And then we have a belief over theta that we can update based on our observations. But that's not enough, right? Like just updating that belief is not enough. So instead, what we do is we update our reward function to be a combination of reaching the goal, which is what it was before, but this other extra term, which is about information gathering. So we have now an entropy over belief of my driving style of this other agent between this time step and next time step. And optimizing for that gets me behavior that tries to gather information. So we've actually tried this out. And then the type of behavior we get is we have our autonomous car, human-driven car. And in this case, what my autonomous car decides to do is instead of just cutting in front of the person, it nudges in to see how the other driver responds. And then based on the responses of the other driver, it updates its model, and it might just go back to its lane, or it might complete the marriage knowing that the other driver is attentive. Okay. So uh, we have validated this actually through user studies, where we bring in users to drive on a simulator. They have a mobile phone to be distracted, so they're playing a game on a mobile phone. Yeah. Uh, so you made a point earlier, uh -huh. uh, two ago, and that was something not being hand-coded, mm -hmm. but instead learned. Mm -hmm. Was there a similar statement here with regard to trying to get in, mm -hmm. not allowed, and hence gets back? It all, that was a learned behavior in that same so style? It was coming out of the optimization. So it was all coming out of the optimization. So we didn't hand-code, if you see a car, do this. We said, just optimize this objective. And in that objective, it's trying to reach the goal. It also tries to get information about the cars around it. And from that objective of, well, I just need to get information about people around me, it decides to do this nudging in behavior. So, so there was a preliminary model mm -hmm. of belief about the model of the human-driven car. And that still was used in order to try out this nudging maneuver, but then it didn't work because the human didn't help. So is that the case? or? Okay. Yeah, so the preliminary model of the human, like the prior, that's learned offline, right? That's what we assume normal drivers like, would drive. So it's given. To yeah, it's given. But in this case, like, we are, like what the assumption is in an online fashion, like when I'm driving, not all drivers are normal drivers, right? I might have more aggressive ones or less aggressive ones, and I have normal drivers. So I have these different modes almost that they can be in. And what we are trying, and maybe 50% are like normal, 50% are aggressive. And what we are trying to learn are these probabilities of how, like this weighted combination, the weights of this particular uh, model of the person. So like, are they more aggressive or less aggressive? So that's the thing that we are trying to, we have this belief over, and we are trying to learn that through active information gathering. All right, so yeah, so we did this user study, and we actually brought in people. And what we saw was when you're doing passive estimation, our users almost do the same thing. So these are actually trajectories from real users in a, 
in a driving scenario. Uh, you see the mean and standard error of, of different trajectories. And in the case of attentive and distracted humans, they almost do the same thing. And it's really hard to differentiate between them. And this is under passive estimation. What I mean by passive estimation is I still have a belief of driving style. I still update that based on my observations. But I'm not actively trying to poke people and get information from them. But if I'm doing active information gathering, I can actually create a much larger gap between distracted and attentive humans. And I get very different behaviors. And this gap is exactly what my algorithm creates and what allows me to have a better belief of driving styles of other drivers around me. So really, the key idea here, like throughout, is, is that robots' actions or autonomous agents' actions influence the actions of other drivers. And we should think about these influences. We should think about these effects. And we, can, we should use them for better safety, efficiency, coordination, or even estimation, as we see in the active information gathering case. Okay. So we have been thinking about continuations of this work. And, and we're thinking about multi-agent systems. And in addition to that, we're thinking about adaptation. So how humans and robots adapt to each other, or how do like, even humans adapt to each other. So um, before talking about, about this, let me actually. So, so the, the particular thing that I mean by adaptation is, if I have a bunch of autonomous cars or human-driven cars on the road, they're going to adapt to each other. They're going to change their behavior based on what they see. Again, like in San Francisco, there is this car company. And they have their cars driving in SF. And all the time, when I see them at intersections, they're for some reason just stopped there. And they're always like stuck there. And based on like, that behavior that I see every time I see one of these vehicles, I just go around it, knowing that they're going to be just stuck there. So I'm adapting my behavior to this particular model that I've built of how this autonomous car drives. And this adaptation is actually a very interesting, um, very interesting problem. And we see that in repeated games a lot of times. And we've started thinking about adaptations in the setting of interaction. And the very first thing we started doing was I have this collaboration with Noah Goodman, who um, was in the linguistics department at Stanford. And we started talking about agents adapting to each other. But it soon we came about uh, talking about language and how in language people start building like conventions, like how you refer to a particular picture might change over time and might reduce. And how do these reductions happen and how people, how listener and speaker adapt to each other. So I'm doing some language work now, which I'm very excited about. But I'm hoping that it will come back to autonomous systems and we can use some of that knowledge to thinking about um, adaptations in, in inter interactive autonomous systems. All right, so let me just wrap up real quick. OK, another direction that I'm super excited about, which uh, we're just starting to work on, is this idea of multi-agent cars and humans. And it started from this idea of thinking about traffic. So traffic is a very difficult problem. It's an old problem. Uh, this is actually a video of uh, traffic in the Los Angeles area in Thanksgiving, uh, the day before Thanksgiving, a couple years back. And, and it's, it stresses me out, so I'm not going to look at it. So um, it's a very expensive problem, right? Uh, since like 2015, it, it has been increasing. And it was around like $160 billion in time and fuel just in the US. So, so that's difficult. And people have been thinking about this for a long time, right? We can think about demands. We can increase, like we can build roads. We can do all these things to, to help with traffic. But our idea is, if you're going to have autonomous cars on roads, might as well use them for some of these problems that exist on our roads. So car companies have been promising that we're going to have autonomous cars by 2020. They said that when I started my PhD. So I'm waiting on that. So we're going to have autonomous cars on roads by 2020. And if that is the case, I think the interesting question to ask is, how can we use those to help with some of these problems? And again, we are not the first people who have thought about this. Like, this is, again, an old idea. Like, people have been thinking about truck and car platooning like, as part of the Berkeley Path project a very long time ago. More recent work is thinking about smoothing and stability. So this is work by Jonathan Sprinkle and Dan Works from University of Arizona and um, from Alex Bayan's work, where they're thinking about how the autonomous car can smooth some of these instabilities that exist when we have a bunch of human-driven cars. And then finally, there's a ton of work that's coming out on ride sharing and mobility on demand. And the specific thing that I'm very excited about is, again, thinking about influencing. So can we leverage autonomous cars to influence the societal scale objectives from a policy perspective, policy of the autonomous car, not regulate, regulatory policy, policy of the autonomous car, and also from a routing perspective. So if I can route my autonomous car differently, or if I can get my autonomous car to influence humans, like cut in front of people, like how is that going to help with some of these traffic objectives? So since I am out of time, I'm going to skip 
most of this section, but this is kind of an exciting area, and I'm encouraging everyone to think about the problems that exist in, the, in this particular area. And let me just show you this one example that we ran in terms of routing. So what we wanted to do was we have four parallel roads, and what we want to do is we want to route autonomous and human-driven cars uh, on these four autonomous roads. And we, what we do is we, um, we characterize different equilibria that one can get. And in the first case, this is a Nash equilibria. We have autonomous cars in, in green, human-driven cars in red. These are four parallel roads. They're not actually lanes. These are parallel roads. And this is kind of the latency that we would get at Nash equilibria. Every one is around 400 at Nash equilibria. And then uh, what we characterize is this idea of robust best Nash equilibria, which is actually a better Nash equilibria one could get. So in the case of mixed autonomy, we have infinite equilibria. And we can characterize this robust best Nash equilibria and actually try to get there. And that actually helps with the latency of the vehicles. So some of these roads are longer than the other. That's why we don't see any, any vehicles on this last road, because it's actually longer than the other roads. And the final idea is we, we, can, we think about this notion of altruism. So if I have a few autonomous cars, Maybe they can be altruistic. Maybe they're willing to take a little bit longer than normal cars. So in this case, this is altruism at the level of 1.5, meaning that my autonomous cars are willing to take 1.5 times longer than human-driven cars. And if that is the case, then I can come up with this better routing algorithm that actually helps the traffic of the full network. So I think it's an exciting area in general. Mixed autonomy and human-robot teaming is, is a direction that would be super exciting to explore. And this is actually in collaboration with uh, Ramtin Pedarsani at UC Santa Barbara and our students, Erdem and Daniel. So with that, I just want to thank you all, and I can take any questions. Yeah. So, so, so many problems you present, especially in your first part of the talk, uh, originated from using human demonstrations mm -hmm. with factories. So I wonder, what if you use simulated trajectories? Is there any reason that you choose to use human demonstration over simulated demonstrations? Over what trajectories? Simulated. Oh, simulated trajectories. Uh, so you mean like expert simulated trajectories? Because they're not. Uh... For example, like in your driving simulation, I think that the trajectory can be easily planned by so using some motion planning algorithms. Yeah, but I want to know how humans do it, right? So the simulated trajectories two reasons to use this. One is, first off, I want to know how humans do this. right? Maybe humans are not this expert trajectories in simulation that we think they might be. The second thing is, uh, if you remember that boat example, that was a thing that we thought is going to be perfect. right? Like we wrote the re reward function, and we, go, we went about like simulating this boat that we hoped is going to optimize the scores and go straight. But we forgot about something, and because of that, we got that weird like spiral behavior of the boat. So simulated trajectories have their own kind of problems. And, and that's part of the reason you want to learn these things from real humans. Question about the preference uh, uh, method. right? So uh, what happens if there's, uh, let's say, noise in the my output of the preference, right? So I say, mm -hmm. hey, uh, I prefer this, but I really didn't mean that. It's yeah. Yeah, so we actually use a noise model there. So the noise model we were using is this Boltzmann rational model, where we're assuming that uh, people have this choice model, which is probable, which is similar to the IRL approach, which is probabilistic to exponential of a reward function. So under that particular noise model, which comes from a psychology literature, we are, we are not completely removing the wrong side. We are just resampling things. Um, when we have rankings, so in some of the settings, we actually have rankings instead of just pairwise preferences. And for that, we use this other model called Placket Loose, which is a very similar idea. And, and we use that to, to kind of model this noise of choices that, that people have. So in the beginning, if I'm way off, I can recover uh, if I just kind of change yeah. my mind. And no, I, I do think this is yeah. an it should, yeah. yeah, it does recover. So my understanding is uh, you tried at first to learn by demonstration. Mm -hmm. Uh, you couldn't, mm -hmm. and that's okay. It's an inverse problem. It, it is a common problem mm -hmm. when you try to learn. Now you said, I am not learning because the demonstrations are bad. Mm -hmm. I'm going to a different uh, kind of data. Mm -hmm. data set. So my, my concern is, wouldn't the modeling of the rewards function it's also or a problem. learning algorithm help on that? And the second, the se for example, the modeling of the rewards function is a weighted uh, sum of what mm -hmm. kind of features? Uh -huh. That's a very good question. It should, it should be very yeah. important. Yeah. One thing is that the second one is when you have a pool of trajectories 
and make this subject. answer the first question. I'm going to forget this again. <laughs> OK, so on the first question, um, yeah, the features are very important. I completely agree. If you miss a feature, then, then we, like, we are not going to learn the, the correct thing. But giving demonstrations is hard, too. So the problems I mentioned like in, in, the, in the first examples is not because we missed a feature or we didn't come up with the right features. right? You, like In the both example, it was because we missed a feature that was corresponding to I don't know, keeping straight. But in the case that I was teleoperating the robot, teleoperating robot was hard. Like The trajectories I was getting was really weird. It wasn't good trajectory. So, so because of that, I was arguing that demonstrations are not that informative. Um, what was your second question? Okay, so for example, what kind what, what are the features? Yeah, so for the case of the driving, we have five features. These are distances, exponential distances to other drivers around us and boundaries of the road. We also had a function of velocity, uh, heading. In the case of the robot, it was very simple. It was three features. And the features were actually the things I had on the, it was, again, distances to, to the disk, distance to the, um, to the, yeah, to the, to the objects around, basically. And these are, again, nonlinear exponential distances that one might consider. Okay, so let me get the second. Yeah, really let's let's take uh, the rest uh, offline, so we have uh, this oh, right. right now. So let's thank the speaker again. Okay. And... <laughs>